First on the agenda, we have our um, introduction of our the <coughs> Department of Veterans Services newly instated cabinet secretary. And if I could um, just read a little bit about it, uh, about him for you. I'm pleased to introduce Acting Cabinet Secretary Donnie Quintana, who was appointed by the governor in November to lead the Department of Veterans Services. He's a graduate of New Mexico State University and from the Inter-American Defense War College. Secretary Quintana served 20 years with the State of New Mexico Economic Development Department Division, excuse me, as a Deputy Director and Community of Business Development Team Leader. Over his 35-year military career, Colonel Quintana served in a variety of leadership positions in the New Mexico National Guard. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Quintana. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. I, uh, I prefer not to stand behind the podium. It has nothing to do with my stature or my height. And, uh, you know, with a name like Donnie James Quintana, you would have thought that I would have been a rock star, right? But, uh, you know, let me begin by saying thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's an honor. It's a privilege. Uh, I am humbled to be able to serve in this capacity. Uh, I really, really respect and honor that the fact that you took time out of your business. And ultimately, remember the, the old mantra, or my mantra, that no veteran will ever be forgotten. We will never forget the sacrifice, the dedication of service, uh, the sacrifice from your respective families and in your service. So thank you again for being here. You know, I, I often say in gist, nobody really cares about your bio but you and your mom. You know, so I uh, typically tell them not to read the whole bio. But uh, thank you for entertaining me on that. I apologize, I missed the cue on the Pledge of Allegiance. I think I was supposed to get up and uh, recognize that. But um, I'm going a little off script, just because I think it's important to feel more comfortable uh, with you all than to be so scriptive, OK? But uh, by a show of hands, how many folks here are representing any of our uh, nonprofit organizations, American Legion, uh, DAD? Great, great, great. Okay, thank you. How many folks are actually veterans? Awesome. That is tremendous. You know, it's a, it's again, it's an honor to be here in front of you, uh, being able to partner with you, and more importantly, be able to advocate for you. My job is to make sure that I advocate with our executive, our governor, our legislative finance, our legislators, and so forth, to ensure that we have the right resources to be able to support our veterans with the best possible support that we can provide. That, that is my mantra, right? That is my marching order, if you will. Um, so they, they've said a little bit about me. I, I do want to take a moment and recognize the efforts and the tremendous support that was provided to this department and leadership by Secretary Smith. She is uh, back in the East Coast. Uh, we wish her the very best, uh, but she, she led this department for a couple of years and. Uh, it's, again, my honor to be able to follow her suit there. We're here today, and I, again, thank you so much for being here. On behalf of Governor Lu uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham, um, we're honored to be able to host this. And what's really important to us is we want to ensure that we continue to develop a network, a system, to be able to adequately provide transportation services to all our veterans <coughs> throughout New Mexico so that they have the opportunity to go out and get secure either that medical attention, that health care, or whatever benefit they need, right? This is a rural state. Having been in state government for, you know, 24 years plus, I've had the liberty or the opportunity to drive from Santa Fe all the way down to Silver City and back in one day. That is a lot of windshield time. It's a big state, right? The fifth largest rural state in the country, so lots of windshield. And unfortunately, our veterans don't always have that opportunity to be able to have that resource to get their appointments. So it's up to us, working collectively. And may I suggest to us all, it has to be a holistic, comprehensive approach for us to be able to accomplish that. The state of New Mexico can't do it alone. Our VA partners can't do it alone. Our nonprofit organizations can't do it alone. But collectively, 
we have a great opportunity to work and leverage not only organization but individual strengths on how we accomplish that. So today you're going to hear and we're going to talk and more importantly, you know, the best lesson I learned in life was from my 99 year old grandmother. She told me in Spanish but I'm going to say it in English. She'd say, you have two ears and one mouth and if you learn to use them in the right proportion, you will be successful in life. So what did that teach me? Learn to listen to people. And the other thing she would share is, uh, and I think this was just for us to be quiet, as long as your mouth is moving, you're not learning, right? So today we have the opportunity to hear from you all. How do we develop that system? What are the needs out there? How do we ensure that we adequately, efficiently, and effectively be able to put something in place to ensure that our veterans, all our veterans, have an opportunity to get transportation services provided to them. It is tremendous. Thank you, federal government, for providing the highly rural transportation grant. But unfortunately, that only allows us to cover 15 of our counties. So we need a work in collaboration. And thank you. Your name eluded me. Hugo. 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 And partnering with folks like Hugo to make sure that we have a blanket of uh, coverage of the whole state. So I'm not going to take any more of your time. I will be here all day today. I am very excited and encouraged to be able to have an opportunity to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, again, definitely want to listen to your thoughts. You know, uh, you folks know way better than I do what the needs are out there, and more importantly, what are the resources that we need in order to accomplish this. We do have the Veterans Transportation Service. We have about six vehicles, and you'll get a briefing on it later, so I won't go into all the details. Hugo will, will explain to you what we do and how we do it and how we prioritize the rides um, for those that are uh, mobility challenged and blind and other veterans. Um, but a good part is that it not only covers the discharges from the hospital, we can coordinate that. It covers the transportation to our main campus here in Albuquerque as well as all the CBOX, so all the different sites of care. Um, but we can also arrange community care because remember, we have that care in the community where you can't be seen timely or the travel distance is too much. You can say, I want to be seen by a provider in my community. And you go through our office of care in the community. We can train, uh, arrange transportation for that as well. So a lot of veterans don't know that. So we do that through third-party providers in the uh, communities. Um, PACTAC is what I really want to mention. So, you know, it's our job as veterans, it's our job as caretakers, family members, loved ones of veterans, to pass on what we know about VA and benefits. And I'll talk to Cesar Romero. He used to work for me in LA. And uh, we'll, we'll get his schedule straight. But uh, what's important is to pass on what we know. So the largest benefit package ever used to be on the benefit side as a director. The largest benefit package that just came out. Make sure you go online and read about it. Make sure you understand. Um, no congressional members per se here, but I'm sure whatever I say about them, I'll get back to them. They got it right. They really took their time looking into Gulf War syndrome. What was causing that? What was in the environment? Why can't we diagnose this? And then they looked at the burn pits and the other things, and they said, what's going on in the military environment? So the PACT Act is not just burn pits. We know what you inhale from a burn pit is bad. It goes into your system. It's about the military environment. It's about vibrations, sounds, repetitive motions in garrison that happen right here at Kirtland. It's about the atomic warriors, the folks that worked on the atomic weapons and in those environments. It is a huge benefits package. So just for perspective, we had nearly 60,000 veterans enrolled in our New Mexico VA healthcare system from Southern Colorado, Durango, all the way down south. There's a few CBOX on the eastern side that are closer to Texas healthcare systems, and those CBOX are controlled by those healthcare systems. So we have the majority of the state of New Mexico and Southern Colorado and those 60,000 veterans, we estimate from the PACT Act over the next five to 10 years, depending on how much we talk about it to other veterans, 
another 28,000 veterans in the system getting taken care of for whatever their military environmental ailments are, whether it's radiation, burn pit, can't push you in water, all that different stuff you hear about. They don't need to go to a lawyer, they need to go to VA and get their benefits and get in the VA system. Because when they go in front of a judge, the judge is going to say the government provided you a remedy for this. Go use the government's remedy. So that's the process. So I'm really excited about the PAC Act. They're doing town halls just for that. And we'll be up in Las Vegas next week having a, a town hall there. Then we'll go south, down towards the south. We've already been out to Gallup. So just talking about that, and Cesar Romero goes with me, and DVS comes out as well. As a group, we talk about these benefits. So make sure you understand that's the largest package of benefits out there. It addresses hearing and a lot of other things. You have a question, ma'am? Yes, and I hate to interrupt you, but um, one of the things that drives me crazy is all these lawyer commercials about the PACT Act. <laughs> is there any way the VA can do national campaign on that and say, go to your local um, Damn VSOs lawyers. and let them... Um, you know I'm a lawyer, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, it's a free country. Any, well, any, anyone is, can say that, and do what they want to do, and we can't really jump out there and stop, just like the medical profession and VHA. And I get that. I don't want to say, don't go to lawyer. That's not what I want. But I want the VA to let them know that the services are provided. That's all they have to do, not say anything against lawyer. But let them know the services provided by VSOs or go to your VA or something. That's all I'm saying. Not, yeah, not that, down that would be lawyers. great, but uh, Congress would have to pass a law that would put that onus on that group of people, and I don't think they will. But we, we partner with them. We have uh, lawyers that have been trained to be veteran service officers as far as taking claims and processing things, and they do it in a pro bono manner. So we do work with the community, but there's that group where they're going to advertise, and you hear it all the time. When I drive in the car to these gifts and see box, I listen to Sirius Radio, and it's all over the radio. But we talk to veterans. We talk to each other. We talk to caregivers. We talk to the family members. Tell people what you know. Tell them where to go. So that's all I really have to say. It's great to be here. You're going to be veteran transportation service from uh, Hugo Rodriguez here. Invitation. It's good to see you all again. Happy holidays. I'm Senator Martin Heinrich, and I am always humbled to serve as the senator for a state with one of the highest rates of military volunteerism. I'd like to start by just thanking everyone at this conference who is working to solve one of the longest running challenges for New Mexico's veterans. In a highly rural state like New Mexico, many of our veterans live a long distance away from their ne nearest VA hospital. That's why so many of us fought so hard over the course of this past year to make sure that we kept all of the VA's community-based outpatient clinics, known as CBOX, that serve veterans in our rural communities open. When I invited U.S. Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Dennis McDonough, to join me in New Mexico earlier this year, I made sure that he saw firsthand how crucially important it is to maintain health care services for veterans in our rural communities. I would like to commend all of the veterans and veterans advocates who made your voices heard. You are literally the reason that we were able to keep those clinics open. Over the years, we've also made major investments to improve telehealth services. That allows veterans to conduct many of their medical appointments and see specialists without traveling hours each way to get to Albuquerque or to El Paso. But we still need to do much more to solve the service gaps and provide transportation for all of the veterans who need help getting to their medical appointments. That's why I strongly support increasing the funding and expanding the scope of the VA's highly rural transportation program in New Mexico. The New Mexico Department of Veterans Services Department currently uses the federal grant funds from this program to transport veterans to appointments at VA or at VA authorized healthcare facilities. That federal funding currently covers 15 counties in our state that the VA classifies as highly rural. But we should be covering a much broader range of veterans 
who live in communities that common sense tells us are also rural. The current service also fails to cover transportation for many veterans living on tribal and Pueblo lands. I am pleased that this conference is gathering stakeholders from around the state to discuss how we can close those major service gaps. I hope that you'll also be able to think through solutions to other challenges like hiring drivers and procuring vehicles. Please continue to work with me as a partner in turning these solutions into real actions. We can never fully repay our veterans for their contributions and their sacrifices, but we must keep our promise to provide all of our veterans and their families with the full care and benefits that they earned. Thank you. We thank the Senator for his message, and um, I, I, it's going to be tough to live up to that, but we are really pleased that he is there uh, in New Mexico and in Washington, D.C. Uh, to help us through this uh, venture. I'm the director of the Division of Healthcare Coordination for the Department of Veterans Services, and I have um, just a pres little presentation about what our division does. <clears throat> we develop and coordinate veterans programs and outreach, including homelessness, housing and health, behavioral health care. <clears throat> we advise and coordinate on all health care related issues for veterans and their families. And some of our uh, main programs are, of course, suicide prevention. We're working with the governor's challenge to prevent suicide, which is a national initiative. We also do veteran homelessness, um, and we're able um, successfully to have a junior bill uh, last year to help in that effort. We do prevention and advocacy in all areas, and we have a women's veterans uh, program, uh, which is run by Teresa Figueroa, who's currently standing right there in the hallway, but she helped check you in. And we, of course, have the Highly Rural Transportation uh, Service, which we're going to talk about. Could I ask a question? Yes, sir. What's the definition or the difference between highly rural and rural transportation? I had a feeling I would get that question. Thank you. It's a definition that was given to us through the um, Federal Veterans Administration, <coughs> uh, through the grant, and they define that as I always get this wrong. One veteran per, um, excuse me, per, um, I believe it's seven square miles. So that's the definition. And that's what we use. Um, and those, the 15 counties, which I'll go through um, in a minute here, will describe um, and, and let you see visually. <coughs> what those counties include. So there are approximately 148,000 veterans in New Mexico. The need for veterans to access health care is absolutely essential. And that's because the aging veteran population contributes to that need for transportation due to the progression of their overall health and, and any disabilities. Uh, as Donna Quintana mentioned, our secretary, New Mexico is mostly rural, and transportation to medical appointments is challenging and sometimes impossible for our veterans. <clears throat> we currently fund 15 counties uh, with the highly rural transportation grant that we um, shortened to HRTG. Uh, there are 18 counties that are not funded by, uh, by this grant. And that makes the 33 counties in New Mexico, so 18 are not serviced. <clears throat> we, uh, our program provides transportation to the three um, um, medical centers, VA medical centers, one in El Paso, Amarillo, and Albuquerque, of course. Tw the 26 C box, we can go to those. And any VA authorized medical clinics and hospitals. So if your doctor or surgeon um, requires that you go to a non-VA, we can um, transport you there as well. We collaborate with the uh, <coughs> VA's uh, Veteran Transportation Service, and that's the program that HEGO uh, runs, operates, and that serves mostly the Albuquerque metro area. 
we are also contracted with the <coughs> DAV. Uh, Tracy, uh, no, you're not with the DAV. Sorry. Who's here? David Alderete? Oh, hi, David. Good to see you again. David Alberte is the um, director for that program, and we contract with him. Uh, he'll talk about his program later, but their drivers are, are voluntary. And it's, it's uh, you know, we have to rely on their service um, to kind of fill in the gaps a lot of times, and sometimes they may or may not have drivers. So we have to be very cognizant of that fact. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> We currently, uh, the HRTG, the Highway Rural Transportation Grant, um, contracts with four third-party transportation services. Uh, they're located in Union County, San Miguel, Lincoln, and then we have a new one in uh, Lovington. And David Kaysen is here from Shuttle Rio Doso, and David will be talking um, about his, his um, transportation service a bit later as well. <coughs> There is, a, of course, a great need for medical transportation in uh, Native American pueblos and tribal lands. Um, unfortunately, our uh, 15 counties are not covered um, in those areas, which is very, very unfortunate. But I believe we do have, we have Beverly, um, Charlie here, I think I saw her. Hi, Beverly, thanks for joining us. Beverly is um, Department of Veterans <coughs> Services Tribal Liaison. So we are hoping to work with her and other um, folks who um, can help us um, support the transportation needs needs in uh, the Native American communities. <coughs> so we're here today at our transportation conference, and uh, we hope this is just the beginning of, of what uh, we can start working on in terms of, of um, expanding our transportation services. So more specifically, these are the counties that we currently serve under the Highly Rural Transportation Grant. So you can see by the map that we're covering um, this section, but the northwest, the southeast, and the southwest areas are highly underserved. And these are the areas that we're hoping uh, we can get covered. And these again cover uh, tribal lands. And so that is what we're um, really looking forward to doing. Now, one way that we may be able to do this, it's um, certainly not um, um, funded yet, but there is a proposal for FY24 starting July 1. And this came out of the governor's office for UBS to receive $750,000 from general funds. And that would be to serve all of the 18 remaining counties. And I'm sure there would be, um, um, hopefully, if this continues, uh, more funding for even the highly rural areas that we don't have enough funding for. So we could expand that as well. So it's going to be just direct services transportation services will be contracted. We don't think it's feasible for DVS to hire drivers and to lease vans. It's just not going to be enough. Um, but we will need some staffing, obviously, and lots of advertising and marketing. So this is our plan for FY24, and this is where we also need your partnership um, so that we can cover our entire state. I'm hoping it's recurring money. Do you have any thoughts on that, Donnie? <coughs> Definitely, that would be our strategy. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so here you can see our actual for FY22 and what we've been able to do um, in terms of transportation for that year. So we've covered 396 veterans received rides, 466 trips, and those are round trip. <coughs> Uh, 124,284 miles, and that was just from the VA um, Highway Rural Transportation Grant. Our estimate for FY23, we did get a, a bit lower amount um, for the HRTG, but we're still estimating we could do 500 veterans, 
425 trips, um, 115,000 miles, and down here for FY24, this is the proposal that we'll be submitting for statewide um, from the general fund. Um, I hope these numbers are achievable. Um, we will definitely have to see and we'll be putting our measurements in place for that. These are some of our contractors that we have. Um, we have, um, we've been contracting for a while with the Golden Spread Rural Transportation um, Express. And um, actually, I think these are all theirs. These are their offices. They are in Clayton in Union County. I haven't been there myself yet. Um, but uh, you can see that we're really spread out all over the state. And um, this service provides um, 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 transportation over into Amarillo because they're so close. And they've also gone into Colorado. So uh, we're thankful for all of our, our providers. Um, again, Shuttle Rio Doso, the DAV. Um, D-Day's transportation, I don't think is here. No, okay. And then Angel's Touch, and Angel's Touch is up in um, San Miguel County. This is all of our contact information. Again, Connie Vargas is who you call for uh, transportation requests. And of course, Teresa Figueroa with the um, Women's Veterans Program. And Jeremy Anaya in the red uh, Sheriff there is our business operations specialist and he does a lot of our reporting and tracking. I'm going to go over what we've, uh, what our capabilities are, what we've uh, been able to cover, uh, and what are some of the challenges that we face as far as transporting some veterans to their medical appointments. So this right here is what our capabilities are right now. This is what we currently have. So we currently have six drivers, six vehicles. We do have five drivers on staff, and we recently just hired our sixth driver. So right now that driver is going through some training, getting them ready, spun up to uh, send them out there to pick up some veterans. All our vehicles have wheelchair capability, uh, so we're able to pick up uh, ambulatory and wheelchair-bound veterans. Each vehicle has about two wheelchairs, six passengers, but right now we do not pick up six passengers due to COVID, so we try to limit that. Um, it does limit our what we can pick up, how many veterans we can pick up at, at one time, but due to COVID, that just to make sure we keep the passengers and the drivers safe, of course, all veterans and drivers do wear masks on the vehicles. Our hours operation are 0600 1730. Now, just keep in mind, when we say 1730, that's when our drivers go home. That's their checkout time. So normally what we try to do is we try to do our last pickups between the hours of 3 o'clock and 330 because we do have those veterans that go out there to Edgewood, Rio Rancho, and by the time those drivers get back, get into traffic, it's about 5 o'clock, 5.30. We do accept the, uh, if a veteran does contact us for support, uh, we do request that they contact us three business days in advance because the way that the VTS works is we schedule the passengers for a pickup. Um, so they will call us, We'll put them in a schedule and then see if we can uh, do have space to pick them up. We do do last minute calls, or if, say if a veteran needs to, needs a ride at the last minute, we see if we can fit them into a schedule. We do sometimes have veterans that cancel, and so that leaves open an open window. So if we're able to fit a veteran in there, we'll squeeze them in. Currently, we are we maximize our to our capabilities in the Albuquerque, Rio Rancho, Edgewood, Belend areas. Um, that's where we pick up most of our veterans, uh, and that's where we try to get the brunt of the veterans in and out of their VA uh, appointments. We also do coordinate with third-party transportation, and these are for the mobility. Uh, the veterans are not able to say get in in and out of a vehicle. Uh, those are the wheelchair-bound veterans and the legally blind veterans. But in order for us to set up that type of transportation using the commercial entities, they have to be what's called beneficiary travel eligible. And if a veteran is beneficiary travel eligible, then through their clinician, we will set them up with a third-party transportation, and that's if we can't pick them up. So we first try to pick them up, and if we can't get them on the schedule, then that's when we contact the third-party transportation and say, hey, we got a veteran that needs a ride. 
can get them in. And for BTS eligibility, it's pretty basic. One, you gotta be a veteran, you gotta be enrolled, and you gotta have a VA medical appointment set up by the VA. And this is taking them in and out to a VA facility or into the community care as well. Now this right here is where our most of area of operation is, as you can see. It's covering all Albuquerque, all the way up to um, Rio Rancho, Bernalillo, and then down south to where Las Nunas, Belen, Los Chavez, and also down up to Edgewood. So this is where BTS maximizes its capability. This is where our brunt of the, our, driver, our riders come from. Uh, so just keep in mind that we only have six drivers. And from time to time, we do go beyond this capability, but that's when we get enough notification, say about a week or two, and it's, it's pretty much a special need. Because when we send a driver out to about two, three hours away, by the time that driver gets back, that driver has probably only picked up that one veteran. As here you can see is our trips by city. As you can see, Albuquerque is our biggest area where we pick up most of our veterans. We also have Belen, Tijera, Las Lunas, Rio Rancho, Española, and Edgewood. But we've also gone to some of these other cities right here as well. But in Albuquerque alone, we've transported over 8,500. And this is for fiscal year October 21st to September 30th, 2022. And here's the types of passengers we've transported. Most of them are ambulatory, but again, we do pick up wheelchair line. Uh, our stretcher right here, our vehicles are not equipped to pick up uh, veterans that require stretcher transport, and this is actually capturing our third party transports as well. So if a veteran needs a stretcher transport and the veteran is beneficiary travel eligible, we will set that veteran up. Our challenges. One of the biggest challenges that we have with VTS is distance. When a veteran calls from truths or consequences and needs a ride over to the Albuquerque VA, it's just really difficult for us to pick up that veteran. It's very, very difficult. We don't say it, we don't tell the veteran, no, sorry, we kids can't do it. Well, if we can't do it, then we try to provide that veteran with uh, optional transportation, uh, the DAV or any other transportation that that city may provide as well for veterans. If we can provide anything for the veteran, that's what we try to do. Unscheduled pickups. We do get a lot of unscheduled pickups. A veteran calls us up, say, hey, uh, can you come pick me up today? Uh, sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. Also, uh, late discharges where a veteran gets discharged from the ER and they contact us, hey, we have a veteran who needs to go home right now. We tr do try to squeeze those veterans in as well. Scheduled appointments, and what I mean by that is, uh, for example, a veteran calls us up, hey, I got a two o'clock appointment and I'll be done around four o'clock. By that time, it may be too late for us to pick up that veteran because most of my drivers are out transporting veterans back to their homes from the earlier appointments. For example, if a veteran lives up in Edge Edgewood and I have a driver that's not on his way back yet, that veteran may or may not get that transportation. But we do phone warn the veteran this. We do tell the veteran, hey, okay, we could bring you in, but there may be a possibility where we can't take you home. At that point, we leave it up to the veteran to see what they want to do. But we also do work with the veterans and say, ask them, hey, can you reschedule your appointment? So we do try our best to try to help the veterans as, as much as we can. <coughs> if we have a driver that, that can stay behind, we will provide that driver over time and say, hey, late discharge, can you, you, can you get them home? But most of the time, our drivers do accept that, those late discharges to get those veterans home. So I do, like I said, I do have six drivers to try to cover most of New, all of New Mexico, which is not, which is not, that fe not feasible. Um, and also when our drivers do, have, do, do, do get sick um, and they're limited to their duty hours as well. So, but when we do need to, we do provide the drivers over time. Other challenges that we have, like you sir, what you explained about veterans living in remote areas. We have come across those as well, especially during the winter times. Our vehicles are not um, all-terrain vehicles. There's those little buses that you see here in the city area as well. Um, in the winter times, we have, do come across those where veterans live in the remote areas up in the mountains and Edgewood, and, and we leave it up to the driver, whether or not the driver can get up there. If the driver feels it is unsafe for the vehicle and for himself or other passengers, then they'll give us a call and tell us, hey, I cannot get up there. 
At that point, we contact the veteran and say, sorry, due to weather conditions, we cannot get to you. Just for the safety of the vehicle, safety of the drivers or the passengers. And here is my contact information. I also do have uh, one of my dispatchers here, Daniel Strode, right over here. Daniel, raise your hand. He is one of our VTS dispatchers. We have two on hand. He uh, takes all the calls to set up the veterans for transportation. And I do have Ms. Sherry Hoff right over here, back over here. She handles some of our special mode transportation as well. Yes, sir. Hello, Paul Rodriguez up there with the Eastern Plains Council of Governments. I'm the regional planner. Um, so I've noticed that throughout all of your presentations that you guys are just primarily focused here in uh, you know, Albuquerque and the surrounding areas. So is there any chance for you guys to branch out maybe um, you know, to uh, Clovis or Portales. I deal a lot with transit funding, 5310, 5311, and there are a lot of um, you know, uh, transit services, the Senior Citizen Center in Clovis, La Casa, transports a lot of the you know, VA uh, citizens. So um, I was wondering if at any point you guys had any type of available funding to branch out. As far as VTS, us um, as branching out that, that far out, that's extremely detailed, very difficult. Of course, that will require us to get more funding, a lot more drivers. But I think Diane right here, um, she spoke about the, uh, the grants that they received and expanding to those other areas as well. Good morning, y'all. Uh, my name is Marie Mora, and I do the marketing for the New Mexico Rail Runner. I've been with the Rail Runner now for 14 years. I was with ABQ Ride Marketing for 13 years. And when the train came in uh, 16 years ago, they asked me to come and be part of the rail runner and help out with the outline areas and all the pueblos. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now, but I do a lot of uh, special projects for them as well. I want to share with you, first of all, um, my I'm very excited to be part of the veterans program, and I've been involved with a lot of you and a lot of familiar faces, you know, Ed and Larry and just some of the great, great people that are part of this group, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I do want to share a story with you because it's very close to my heart. Um, my husband is a veteran. Uh, he's a Pulper Heart recipient. Uh, he served in Vietnam. He has his own unit. And uh, around Thanksgiving time in 68 in Vietnam, his sister sent him a canned ham. You've heard of canned hams before? And you put them in put him in your backpack for the holiday, and that's what he did. He said he'd share this can ham with his unit once Thanksgiving came around. So he carried this can ham for about two years before Thanksgiving came. And in between that time, his unit got hit pretty darn hard, he lost several of his soldiers. And um, Thanksgiving came, and he said, it's time for me to open this can ham, and we'll share it with our rations and go from there. And so took it out of his backpack. And I hate to tell you this, but there was a, actually a bullet inside the canned ham. So my canned ham, my canned ham that my sister-in-law sent to him, actually saved his life. And so I always tell that story because it's very dear to my heart and kept him alive for me. And I've had him now for 50 years, and part is a veteran. So I would like to see a hands, a show of hands of how many are veterans again. I know that. Great, thank you all for serving. How many of you are, are 60 plus? Raise your hands. Oh, good, okay. So this is what I have to offer you. Uh, eight years ago, I went to Washington, D.C. for a marketing conference, and it was for veterans. And I took the entire day of training regarding veterans' issues. It was from transportation, education, uh, legal, divorce, anything I wanted to take, I took it through the entire day. So at the end of the conference, I went over to the folks that were just working on grants for transportation. And I said, how can I get some of that money to come into New Mexico? And they said, well, here's the packet. And they gave me a packet about this big. Brought it back in my suitcase, studied it, gave it to our grant writer, Connie, when, we got, when I got back. And I said, Connie, figure out how we can get some of this money for New Mexico. She said, well, if you get this money, Marie, what are you going to do with it? And I said, well, I'll worry about it when it comes. Mm -hmm. So put the idea in my head overnight. I kept thinking, oh, how am I going to use this money if I get it? God, thank you for giving it to me if you can. So about two, later, two months later, she called me. She said, hey, Marie. 
We got the money. Now what are you going to do with it? And I'm like, oh, Lord, now I've got to come up with all those ideas. So one of my main things was to get a committee from the marketing department, some of the folks from Santa Fe, some of the folks from Española down south, and just kind of work it out, trying to figure out, now we have this money, pocket money, what are we going to do with it? So what we decided to do with the rail runner, first of all, is to give every one of our veterans a free train pass so that they can move back and forth from more the areas throughout the city. And also Santa Fe, Las Lunas, and Las Cruces. Okay, so now I have this money and I can give this, uh, like I said, this uh, free train pass, but I was also able to come up with a project so people that are 60 plus, they get to ride the train for free every Wednesday. So if you're a veteran and you need your um, partner or your spouse or your folks that are working with you to get you to Albuquerque, to the Veterans Hospital, they can ride the train as well for free too on Wednesdays. So, what I'd like to know, how many of you have been on the train more than one time? How many have been on the train twice? How many have been on three times? Four? Okay, well I have some gifts for you. You folks that have been on the train for four times, Here's a deck of cards to keep you busy when you're on the train, okay? <laughs> Learn some poker. But what I want to share with you is that I am able to go out into the rural areas and work with, uh, with the folks in the, all of the Pueblos. Uh, right now, we're, we have buses that go out every day into the Pueblos and come back. The only service that we're not providing right now is to Santa Ana because they have not let us on to the Pueblo. But everybody else, Santa Domingo, Coach D, is let up, we're on bringing those people back and forth. We're connecting them, that's what we do, we connect people in transportation. So I just want to share with you is that we are available, the train is free for our veterans, the buses are free, we have ABQ ride back here with Nick. Those buses are free for all of our veterans to get on and ride every day if they want to do that. So, what I want to also to share, I come from Union County, Clayton, thank you for bringing it up. Who brought that up? Oh, that. And it takes me, it takes one of our veterans four hours to get here to the medical center, four hours for them to come back. If they're in a wheelchair, if they've got a walker, crutches, it's going to take them a little bit longer because our folks are going to have to drive and stop, stop and drive and give them a break every once in a while. So we need to figure out, folks, today, something to help these veterans to get here faster and maybe open up a new area and let them know that we're here to help them. So I'm asking you to really put your heads together, your thoughts, and let's get these people back and forth faster than we need to. So I will be here for a while. I have another engagement at 1130, but I have packets of information for you. You should have received them in your bags today. And please let me know if you can help, uh, if I can help in any way, as far as uh, connecting these folks, our veterans together. Good morning, my name is Tracy Kincaid. I'm the General Services Director with the Veterans Integration Centers. So uh, as far as this transportation needs with the, the veterans, we have a, a community shuttle uh, that's operated through the city. Um, and then we, 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 um, we transport on, on the shuttle. So um, about the VIC, the Veterans Integration Center is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 2005, is a resource for veterans and their families in New Mexico. The VIC provides a multitude of services including multiple housing assistance options, peer support, food and nutrition, and case management services for veterans and their families in the communities. Um, the VIC currently provides transportation for our current and former graduates of the residents of our transitional housing program with a 24-hour notice. Um, if they need rides to maybe employment, um, interviews, you know, events and stuff like that, they can come through us and then we can get them to and from. If the city uh, transportation is not on their route or the times are different, that they need to get there, we can provide that for our residents. Um, transportation is provided if the hours of the city buses are not in line with the event or bus route does not work for them if the veteran has a disability. We do that too. All our vans and, and shuttle bus 
are wheelchair accessible. Now currently the VIC operates a contracted transportation. It's a fixed route uh, for the city of Albuquerque. The route is called the Community Support Shuttle through the Family and Community Services Department. This service is free, okay? Uh, it's also listed on the city website. There's the website. Uh, the service is provided to anyone, but mostly the homeless or at-risk people ride the shuttle, but again, it is free to everybody. Um, unfortunately, there's no services to pick up to and from uh, residents, homes. It has to be on a route. Uh, the shuttle runs Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 3.30 p.m. We do not operate on holidays. And so far, um, we have picked up January through September of, of 2022, riders of veterans, 140. So we have a dedicated driver and a dedicated peer support to try and identify veterans on our shuttles. Again, they're mostly homeless or at risk. And then we try to get them the services that they need or get them into services. Okay, and that's not just our services, VA or anything else. This is our route right now. We just expanded our route up to, we used to operate downtown on the first and second <coughs> streets. Uh, we, now we're up to uh, almost the Louisiana area. So um, anybody that, that needs a ride can get to any of these locations. And if they need to get downtown, we can get them to the closest area that they need to go. We also provide uh, as requested stops if they get on the shuttle. If they need to go to the VA, they can just say, we need, I need to go to the VA, we'll drop them off at the VA. So, and then there's the, the community shuttle phone number. I do have brochures, and again, it's also on the city website. So if you have any veterans in that area that needs a ride downtown or uptown, we can get it to them as long as it's on our route. Hopefully in the future, We'll be able to expand our transportation to provide services if they need to get anywhere um, around the city. Uh, but right now, we're not capable of doing that. We're in the process of hopefully building a new building, or our main campus, where it's a one-stop shop for all the veterans. Um, so maybe we'll expand out there on the transportation internally and working with the VA and all that good stuff. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a, a veteran in Muscalero, right? Uh, a homeless female veteran. And if she falls inside, would you, if she needs services, they don't have it there. Would you guys be able to provide uh, services to go pick her up and have and house her in big? I guess kind of. Yes, all she. There was, there's a service number that I to Yes, all they would need to do is just call her main phone number, 296-0800, and talk to a case manager, and they'll work with the the veteran, and if she needs to come up here into our programs, yes, we will definitely go down and get her. Thank you, Diane, Hugo, uh, and this team for hosting us today. This is really great. Uh, I'm David Kaysen, uh, the president and owner of Shuttle Redoso. Um, we are a non-emergency medical transportation company uh, with a fleet of 65 vehicles, uh, primarily across the southeastern quadrant of the state. Uh, all the way from Lovington, Hobbs, up to Clovis, around to Tucumcari, TRC, Las Cruces, Alan Gordo, Ridos, Mescalero, and uh, uh, Roswell, Carlsbad, Carlsbad and uh, Artesia. <clears throat> um, we operate, um, we have contracts with the uh, State of New Mexico Medicaid, uh, Centennial Care Program, Indian Health Services, uh, some Medicare companies, and we have proudly serves, serviced our veterans uh, through uh, a, a direct contract with the VA and now with the DVS uh, for about a decade. Um, last year, uh, the shuttle logged nearly 3.8 million miles uh, across our state servicing uh, veterans and uh, uh, Medicaid clients. I'm also here today um, representing the Results Driven Action Coalition, which is a coalition of transportation providers across the state. Um, also here representing the coalition is Shanda uh, Paltza from Deming Medical Transit. 
And our coalition uh, is roughly 30, 35 uh, transportation companies all over the state representing uh, about 500 vehicles that does uh, non-emergency medical transportation. The coalition formed a little over a year ago uh, to tackle and address uh, transportation issues and operational struggles across the state, many of which are some of the same issues that we're trying to address here today through this DVS program. New Mexico is very unique. Um, it's an, our network spans uh, 155,000 square miles, uh, mostly rural, making access to quality health care uh, a challenge for many, including our veterans. Our average uh, trip is about 100 miles one way, and many of our many of our transports are sometimes two and 300 miles one way. Our network of transportation providers um, have experienced significant operational challenges uh, with a one-two punch of COVID and now unprecedented uh, inflation. In the last 18 to 24 months, our network has lost over a dozen transportation companies across the state. And they've closed their doors for good. Taking nearly uh, 150 vehicles and drivers out of the transportation network. The rising cost of vehicles, um, uh, the rising cost of, of maintenance, gas, labor, um, coupled with our stagnant reimbursement rates has, has caused the decline in, in our network. Transportation um, has not seen a programmatic rate increase, mileage reimbursement rate increase since 2007. It's important to highlight that uh, transportation is a key stepping stone uh, function to access quality health care, especially in a dispersed state like New Mexico. Um, data show that investment in transportation decreases the overall cost burden to health care systems, um, including the VA. So I thank uh, Diana Morning Brown and her team um, again for making this investment into the transportation network to the benefit of our rural veterans and overall health through this program. Um, I guess the moral of my story is that the, the coalition is here, um, our, co our coalition of transportation providers are here to, to provide service to the veterans and, and members across the state and we're very passionate about our industry. Um, but transportation in and of itself is, is costly. It is um, our hope that um, the elected officials and civil servants present here today will elevate our cause um, to promote and support programs similar to this uh, rural transportation grant uh, to the benefit of our veterans. I'm not quite sure how to follow all the people that preceded me. I think we all, all of us are faced with different types of problems. Our problem at the DAB is that we are state funded, <coughs> excuse me, and we are very limited. By limited, I'm talking about we provide transportation to and from VA medical centers namely Albuquerque and Beaumont and El Paso. Because of internal whatever problems the VA has, they cut off the southeastern part of the state and they are now going to either Lubbock, El Paso, or Amarillo. We, on our contract, are limited to within the state. The only exception is southern Colorado, southwestern Colorado. And there we run into problems with the legislators locally because they say, why are we serving people in Colorado? When you're in the military, you don't ask, where the hell are you from? The other problem, and I just heard it 
by my predecessor here was the cost of transportation. We are bound by the going rate for the state, which is 40 cents a, a mile. And uh, that's not cutting it when prices previously were at five, over $5 a, a gallon. We lost a lot of drivers, and our drivers are all volunteers. When I started with the DAV 14 years ago, our contract was around a hundred and some thousand. It's less than half of that now because of the loss of drivers, and yet we are seeing an increase especially among the Vietnam veterans, we're seeing an increase on dialysis, and that requires three trips a, a week, oftentimes. We don't have the drivers, but yet we are really restricted. Now with the opening up of uh, referrals to the private sector, that's opened up the Albuquerque area. It wasn't open to us before. We had to go within a 50-mile radius outside of Albuquerque, which meant we couldn't service Rio Rancho. It's been a, it's been a struggle, but we've managed to survive for over 20 years. Don't ask me how, but it's, it's a problem. It's a real problem. Financially now, with the uh, b because our program doesn't have a fleet of vehicles. It's a POV, privately owned vehicle. We reimburse the mileage rates, and that's supposed to cover them, the maintenance on their vehicle, gas, and so forth. You really have to be dedicated to volunteer. The city of Gallup, the chapter in Gallup, is faced with a situation now. They don't have a driver that volunteers. They want to be paid. I'm trying to work something out <coughs> with them. And I don't know, I, I just don't see us surviving more than three or four years down the road, unless Somebody in Washington opens up the whole damn state as rural and quit selecting the counties that have the least amount of veterans. Round of applause for all the presenters. Thank you all. <laughs> so obviously the folks that presented are part of the solution, right? And within that solution there are challenges, but there are also opportunities. Well, let's address today's challenges and opportunities and tomorrows. When I was in Afghanistan, I would tell young captains, don't fight yesterday's battle, fight tomorrow's battle. The great leaders are those leaders that have the ability to look around the corner, to foresee what the next challenge is, right? So that we know that we have an aging population, not only in New Mexico, but across the country. When you think about there are about 12,000 veterans in New Mexico that are 85 years old plus. Thank God we still have them, number one. Number two, we definitely got to be able to forecast the projections of what that and those needs are going to trigger. 35% of our veterans are either Korean War veterans or Vietnam veterans. That's an aging population. So we got to be able to develop the services that we need to address those targeted populations. Does that make sense? So one of the things you'll find about me is I'm a data guy. I like a lot of data. But I do ask you to open your minds and think creatively about how we move this state forward and be able to provide the best possible care to our veterans moving forward as partners. Okay? So you've heard presentations from some of our, tra our transportation providers um, throughout the state. You know right off the top of your head what the transportation needs and challenges are in your communities. 
or lack of. And um, we've heard, of course, about um, uh, the tribal, tribal lands um, where there's absolutely nothing. We've heard about the metro area. So I just want you to, um, to, to come up with what you believe are the challenges and needs of transportation in your areas. free rides to veterans because they know that, you know, we have to take care of our veterans. We have uh, yeah. certain trainings. And Access to phone numbers. Okay. The word of mouth will get spread and then they'll spread it. What we were looking at is um, expansion of transportation to veterans in more rural communities and the accessibility of it as well as we all know a lot of veterans are not able to you know walk really well or they have these large wheelchairs that are uh, electric and 500 pounds you know so being able to uh, get funding for transportation for these veterans with these special needs and services not just specialized in one one part of the state in like the metro hubs like Albuquerque or Santa Fe, but the whole state. Um, being able to look at FTA grants, the Federal Transit Agency grants, um, for veterans specializing in, you know, uh, stuff like that is something I think that the VA definitely could do. Um, so, what we're going to do to bridge the transportation gap until 2024 because there's a huge lack there um, in the Gallup area. Um, so there's, I believe she said that the veteran services there is completely going away there until that time. So being able to find some sort of service for that area and, you know, being able to really get <laughs> get that taken care of in not just that area, all areas. Um, so they go to home is not available in some areas, like the rural places. Um, as we know with COVID, a lot of the rural places um, went into, you know, uh, mental health breakdowns and whatnot, and they started doing everything telephonically over, you know, Zoom, over video calls and whatnot. So being able to have that accessibility to veterans for the services that they need would be something that I think would help bridge the gap as well. Veterans are aging, they do not have the vision, uh, they use wheelchairs, stretchers. Um, being able to allow their caregivers to be transported with them would be a great thing. A lot of these metro hubs like once again, the larger cities are still COVID uh, regulations in place. So being able to allow these things is really, really ne necessary for our veterans. Um, then who would be eligible? You know, reviewing what we can do in order to have eligibility for Medicaid or uh, as I was telling our group, Medicare Part B, you know, does allow for some transportation, but it's not there are a lot of people still exempt from it. So being able to review that and maybe uh, the VA with their state funding or uh, even federal funding set that aside to be able to, you know, allow for veterans to uh, successfully get this type of transportation and care that they need. Um, once again, review disability for Medicaid to expand it. Um, of course, that would probably be an act of Congress or legislation. Um, I work pretty closely with a lot of them. They're a lot, you know, everyone cares about our veterans. Everyone does. So whatever we can do, I will definitely try. Um, so mental health in some areas is limited, as we said earlier. Um, organizations such as uh, Forward Flag, um, maybe getting some sort of application made with a one-stop shop for all veteran care services for that area or for the state would be very beneficial to our people, especially veterans. Because, um, I mean, if you don't know how to use the technology as well, you know, caregivers would be able to do that or uh, whatever the case may be um, for mental health, for 
vision, you know, for dental, for just everything. Maybe a one-stop shop application would be a great idea. Now, um, transportation to small clinics. As you guys know, New Mexico is super rural and it's gigantic. Um, we do not have uh, the capabilities to transport from a Fort Sumner to a Melrose sometimes, and that's, that's a huge deal, um, especially for our veterans. Now, aging population, partnerships with the AAA, the Aging and uh, Long-Term Services in Santa Fe, they cover the whole state. I think being able to bridge the gap with them and speak to them about maybe getting some sort of regional and or state transportation uh, transit service together. Um, with the North Central New Mexico Economic Development District, uh, Paul City, Monica Beta, they're super great. They have a pilot program right now for a regional transit agency that they're doing, and I'm going to play off of that um, for the East as well, maybe getting it all together at one point for the whole state, different COG regions, all that good stuff. Now, um, not all elderly people can ride on public transportation, so just being able to have those vehicles available to, to our aging population. Our group came up with quite a few things, not more than they had, but we grew up bigger. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that I was talking about, and I'm part of 100% New Mexico, the branch of, of it as, is 100% Chavez County, and I would recommend everybody to go to that website, 100% New Mexico. It is about connecting services, vital services, to all of our population. So what we're talking about here is, if I wouldn't have come to this meeting or been invited to this meeting, I wouldn't know about these issues. And so it's important that we get those, those issues out to other people that not aren't just interested in veterans, but are interested in transportation as a whole. We need more private industry support because government has a tendency not to allocate very many funds to transportation. There's a definite lack of communication. Um, we're, as a veterans community, you're very tight-knit and you have communication amongst yourselves, but not necessarily outside of that group. Rural areas are reluctant to ask for help, uh, probably tribal areas especially, because one of the things is a language barrier. We probably don't know how to speak to them in their, their native tongue, and we don't have any people that are able to do that either. We need a lot of local level advertising. What we run, again, run up against in Roswell Transit is our people are typically not internet users. They either don't have access to the internet uh, because if they are given, if they're provided a phone by the government, that's all Wi-Fi. But I don't know if you know, but a lot of our homeless population has been kicked out of every organization like McDonald's that provides free Wi-Fi. And so they don't even, they can't even, I guess they can stand outside the building maybe, but they'd still get run off. So being able to advertise in a non uh, internet, non-web-based <laughs> format is extremely important in a rural setting. Um, we need boots on the ground. They talked about that uh, this morning and uh, you, in some cases we need to be able to go door to door and say, hey, could you help? Are you a veteran? Do you need help? Do you know how to get services? That sort of thing. There's a definite lack of vehicles for this transportation, but I was talking to our group that um, our vehicles are, have a lifespan. So the Federal Transit Administration has decided that when you drive a mid-sized bus that you can drive it 185,000 miles or 10 <coughs> years and then you're eligible to get a new one. But that doesn't mean that that vehicle is used up. So that vehicle could be provided to another organization that needs it for this kind of transportation. However, there's because of anti-donation laws within our state uh, to obviously prevent corruption, we can't just donate it to another organization, but our legislature could make a pathway for that to happen where the state could approve it or, or someone else higher up the food chain could approve that 
donation or pr approve it being <coughs> sold at a very minuscule cost, like a dollar or something. Uh, we talked earlier about language barriers, so we need people who can speak uh, Spanish fluently, we need people who can speak in the tribal languages, and a lot of that, because there is very limited funding, is going to come from volunteers. Uh, we talked about this earlier, no internet access and no computer skills either. So we just have to go back to old school. We gotta, we gotta get some information in people's hands. Um, I don't suggest that we go out to windshields and put them on people's windshields because most of those people don't have a vehicle. So that's not one of the modus operandi of giving them the advertising. But we have great bulletin boards, we have um, rack cards we can put into doctor's offices, we have uh, just all other bulk mailings, just all kinds of other things go back to our old marketing skills where we didn't use the internet all the time and, and do it that way. Volunteer liability. There's a huge liability for insurance in all of this. And so um, we can't control what private industry does with insurance costs, but we could possibly through the, the uh, government uh, the legislature do something about the liability that we have to incur, either taking some of that cost, putting it in the self-insurer's fund, uh, doing something, something along those lines. We need grant writers. We need people who really know how to go out and get dollars. How do we go out and get those funds? <coughs> that's not my forte, so that's not something that I do well. But there are people who do that well, and we need to enlist them in helping <coughs> us out. We talked about government vehicles to other agencies, and we need support from our local government. We need them to get bought in to the need. And that's going to require us going to our city councilors and talking to them and saying, hey, this is really important. And not just a small group of us are, are thinking this is important, but a large group. I know that not hasn't been too many years ago that our cemetery in Roswell got a veteran cemetery. So there, there is a group there that it's important to them about veterans and their needs. So we need to tie into that as part of the communication, getting those people to help us with that. <laughs> getting who, people who care about veterans actively involved in what we need. That's important. And there are people who are really dedicated to that and who are really good at it. Um, I'm not terribly charismatic, so you probably wouldn't want me going and trying to talk, talk someone into that, but there are people who are good at it. Remove some of the obstacles for private organizations. If, if we've got the private organizations and the government organizations working together in a partnership, then we shouldn't limit the private organization's ability to get more funding, uh, to put their advertising in the same place as other organizations that are government run, put their advertising. We should be working together because just government run transportation is not gonna be enough. We have to enlist the private sector as well. And we also thought maybe having central dispatch would be a great idea. One number you could call in the state and say, I really need to get a ride from Carlsbad up to, to Artesia to the VA. And, and that central dispatching could help you schedule that ride because they have access to everyone who's providing that. So you don't have to call seven places. They're going to do that for you and give you a call back. During COVID, we came up with so many solutions. We, were, we got really good at a lot of different things. And one of the things uh, one of the members of our group was talking about is when there were no beds at hospitals, there was one number you could call. They would find you a bed. They would find you the closest place to get a bed. We could do that for our veterans. We could give them one phone number to call to get a ride one phone number to call to get services. You say, hey, I, I don't know what to do, and they help you 
either get in touch with a counselor who can help you get through that or help you get a ride or something along those, those terms. Get the NMDOT and the VA and other government officials all talking amongst themselves. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, but we kind of thought that maybe the DBS could have uh, more flexible hours, maybe uh, 24 hours or, after, or on weekends uh, availability, so in case veterans were to need uh, a right to urgent care or something of that nature, that I mean, maybe it's a possibility. Um, we heard not being able to access uh, veterans who were needed in remote areas, so maybe having some off-road vehicles or electric vehicles would be an option. I know that there's going to be rebates for electric vehicles if anybody's interested in that. Um, let's see. Um, we were thinking about volunteers, like where to pull volunteers from, and uh, we were kind of thinking of universities. Um, a lot of the, the students who need to have uh, you know volunteer hours that they have to meet, so maybe you know, considering that and. Someone else mentioned a messaging, and we just thought maybe radio messaging to a lot of these communities that don't have internet access or are lacking access to you know internet or, or computers. Over the last several years, I have been just talking to different veterans about the problems they've been experiencing. Um, a lot of it comes down to transportation. Um, we're calling VA, trying to get our rides set up, and we hear, oh, well, you're not have a disability rating you're not eligible or you don't have a disability rating high enough you're not eligible so that's one of the things um, is the DVS willing to pick up those things that the VA is saying we're not covered for and whether we are or we aren't I'm not sure but there's a disconnect somewhere that these are the things that the veterans are being told um, same with deceased veterans they're um, surviving spouse or dependents being told the same thing. Um, so there's just a lot of miscommunication. Um, and so some of our things that we would like to see solutions brought to were a lot of people are mentioning volunteers um, or but getting drivers and getting drivers paid more money. That's why a lot of the non-emergency medical transportation providers have gone out of business um, in the last several years is because of a lack of funding. And we all know the funding's there. We just have to get it into the pockets of the people doing the work. Um, someone mentioned vehicle capabilities and supplies. What are they going to be? Like four-wheel drive, um, what types of vehicles, wheelchair vehicles, um, AEDs. Um, along with that, driver qualifications, like what level are they qualified to, CPR certified, um, things like that. And those are things that we could help the veteran to feel more comfortable about asking for rides knowing that they're being taken by someone that um, has certain qualifications and skills. Um, and so the zero, no disability requirements for transportation. What is the DVS's stance going to be on that? All veterans, um, which I would like to see all veterans eligible, you know, not having a certain disability level or um, any of that. If you're enrolled in the VA program, you should be provided transportation. Um, a three-day notice. Um, sometimes it doesn't always work like that. I mean, nobody can get a VA appointment in three days. It takes three months. So, um, oh, underserved areas, um, getting more providers. Um, we had someone ask, what if just an individual wants to get, get started, get set up? How's that process going to look? How is the money, the turnaround, the payments going to be set up for someone to be able to provide those services for veterans? Um, okay, so the 06 to 17.30, 6 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. time frame. Um, I know the, the non-emergency medical transportation providers out there are 24 hours. Maybe in the metro area, that's something that is feasible. Um, but there are other solutions out there that are outside of those hours because if a veteran has an appointment at four, well, it's going to be over at five, you know, they still need to ride home. Um, the billing turnaround, tribal veterans. Um, I'm only familiar with the Mescalero Apache tribe. Um, a lot of times they're overlooked or services aren't available, like they said, off of the highway or into the tribe. So at the a Mescalero Apache tribe has done is they have a program that was set up for their their elderly members 
but they've also tapped into the veterans, giving veterans rides elsewhere, but it's coming out of that budget that was set aside for their elderly members to get their transportation. Um, a main thing, PRC regulations, um, just brought up the DVS communicating or somehow with PRC, once you cross that paid barrier of volunteer to pay, you're gonna run into the PRC because they are gonna control everything that's paid, transportation, and it's not the easiest organization to deal with. Um, it's definitely not easy for someone to get started. Um, a gentleman mentioned up in northern New Mexico where it's very rural, very mountainous, um, for an individual to be able to get started to provide services for veterans. So those were the things that we brought up that we would like to see solutions for. A bunch of the things that other groups mentioned, um, there's already solutions for, provided by the non-emergency medical transportation providers. There's just not the communication there to get everybody together to say, this is what we do, this is what this group does, to all come together to, to find these solutions are already here, now all we have left is this. Um, yes? I said, I just wanted to clarify something in case I misunderstood it, but the Highland Rural Transportation Program does not have a disability qualification. Any veteran in the rural area that needs transportation to a local from cars, they do not need to be disabled. Unfortunately, a lot of them are, but there's no disability qualification for us. Okay, so that's good. The, the highly rural transportation grant doesn't have a disability requirement. Um, and I personally, I don't have any problems with the VA providers or employees. They have all been great. As an organization, there are some shortcomings, and we're not going to change it. It's just the way it is. So hopefully the DVS will fill in um, those gaps. So let me clarify when we call the VA, not the DVS or anybody else, the VA who is in charge of our benefits, we are being told, uh, oh, you don't qualify for transportation, or you only qualify for yourself, not a spouse or dependent, or you're only this amount disabled, whatever. Whether or not that's true, I don't know, but these are the things that veterans on the ground are being told when we are trying to obtain transportation. And a lot of veterans, are just willing to forego getting medical treatment, behavioral health, mental health treatment, because it's so stressful to have to do all this if all the organizations and people here could just come together and take one more thing off of the veteran's mind, one more thing that they don't have to be stressed about, it would make a big difference. Myself, speaking for myself included. Um, you know, just that one little thing you don't have to stress about. So that's good to know. The, the highly rural transportation grant doesn't have any disability requirements. And speaking for myself, um, I don't think a veteran should have to be disabled to get transportation to a doctor's appointment. They've already done enough and fought for their life enough. They don't need to come home and still fight for benefits. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and that was a good segue. Uh, because we're going to do a Q&A, but I just want to wrap up this session and kind of tell you um, or suggest to you what um, <clears throat> is going to happen with all of your good work. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> so uh, we wanted to get everyone together so that we could, one, identify what our needs are and our challenges and as the gentleman just spoke, really clarify who does what, what are the eligibilities, et cetera, of all of our transportation um, services and programs in the state of New Mexico. So I suspect that we will take this information and I want to get us all back together, um, I would say quarterly, but specifically after the legislature when we know some um, definite bills and <clears throat> excuse me, other initiatives <clears throat> excuse me, will be approved. So I'm thinking April time frame or so. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and I want to put this into a sort of report 
And I don't want this report to sit on your shelf and gather desk, dust at all. We're going to get back together. We're going to go through this. I'd like to try to prioritize a lot of these needs and, and challenges so that we can then put a plan together statewide to address rural transportation. And in my book, the whole state is rural. So I, I think uh, there was one group that mentioned uh, grant writing. I think there is a lot of opportunity out there for us to apply for additional funding. It doesn't have to be the VA. It doesn't have to be the state. It could be private foundations. It could be corporations, the US Department of Transportation, et cetera. Excuse me. Um, so there's lots of opportunities. So we'll take this information. We'll have uh, a team of folks putting it together, doing an analysis, and coming up with data, which Secretary Quintana uh, <laughs> lives for. <laughs> and then we'll get us all back together. Uh, also, Ray has videotaped our session. Thank you, Ray. And that will be disseminated widely um, on our website, I'm hoping, uh, social media, many different um, places that, that Ray has access to. And as far as the PowerPoint, we will get that out to you, either uh, Jeremy or Ray, I think uh, we decided. So we do have all of your email addresses and we will make sure you get all of our information, okay? So with that, we've got a few more minutes, we're doing okay on time, for any questions and answers that you may have you know, after your session here um, from your groups, et cetera. So Hugo and I and even Secretary and Caesar can um, help field uh, some of your questions. Okay, so uh, as this nice lady was saying earlier about uh, getting more organizations on a Fed level together to kind of uh, come up and brainstorm with solutions, um, I let her know that there's something called the Roots Initiative Pilot Program that the USDOT is currently uh, initiating, and they are doing that exact thing, the USDOT, uh, USDA, HUD, all of those great groups, EDA, are coming together to see on a rural level what they can all do and pitch in to come and bring solutions to rural areas. New Mexico is one of the states in those pilot programs. I do have the, the information for my point of contact, Alex Clegg, for the USDOT. If you guys would like that, I'm more than happy to share. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you. We would absolutely love that information. And, and on that note, I will say that um, <coughs> you saw the message from Senator Heinrich. Um, he is definitely one of our supporters for rural transportation and can take that, um, you know, <laughs> further than, than New Mexico. So I'm, perhaps his office we can stay in touch with um, and see what opportunities there may be at the federal level. Thank you. There's something I forgot to mention. Um, in private industry freight hauling, um, oh. typically they will try to get back hauls. So if they haul something to Albuquerque from Las Cruces, for, for instance, that truck doesn't want to drive back to Las Cruces empty. So they try to get a back haul to go back to Las Cruces. We should be thinking in those terms with people, not as freight, obviously, but in terms of you don't ever want to go either way empty. So if you end up having to take somebody to the hospital and leave them there, what you need is a backhaul. So that's another reason to get a centralized phone number that they could call and say, hey, I'm going to be going empty back to wherever, and do, does anybody need a ride? What's the capability of perhaps reducing the amount of geography these transporters actually have to travel in order to provide a convenience not only to the veteran but to the family? Because let's say, for instance, not all veterans, when they attend an appointment, requires to be there all day, for instance. So if, let's say, for instance, if we would work in a partnership with some of these healthcare uh, like the hospitals, for instance. There's obviously hospitals throughout the whole state that can probably provide, I'd say, at least 90% of the services to the veteran. And I believe you're, you're, you're talking about community care, which the, uh, the VA does offer community care. 
So, and I'm not too familiar with community care. I'm a little more familiar with it. Oh, right there. There you go. So, community care could be a fabulous thing, but there's a lot of barriers with it. One is it's funded by a separate financial entity, and so there's only certain hospitals, clinics, doctors that accept it. The other huge barrier is that they reimburse at a certain rate and it's very low as compared to the insurance companies. And so what ends up happening is they contract and then when they aren't being reimbursed a reasonable rate, they say, sorry, we're not gonna do this. And so that's a huge barrier. So we tell our veterans the service is available, but in reality, is it really available if none of the doctors will take it? Yeah, if I can just throw my five cents was in on that one too. Both comments here. I'm not a vet, not a U.S. veteran myself, but I've driven veterans for nine years to appointments, and I've seen the same thing. The VA tells all kinds of stories about this stuff. And they tell all kinds of stories that if you are living closer to El Paso, uh, in Carlsbad, for example, you can easily transfer yourself from the hospital here in Albuquerque to El Paso. It takes forever and ever if you ever get through the system with it. So there's a lot of BS floating around. But here's the point. And the, the basic point is all government efforts and all government bureaucrats are always telling you that the first thing, their first priority is safety. Safety is number one everywhere. And pardon me, total bullshit. <laughs> but here's the example. I'm taking veterans from Carlsbad to Artesia to the clinic. I have to take them twice each year for their annual. They have to go and have to get their blood work done, their lab work. Then one week later, I have to take them to see the doctor. So I have to drive them a 70 mile round trip two times. We have in Carlsbad two facilities that do lab work for anybody. And how the, the VA does not accomplish to ever get contracts interesting enough for those facilities to do that work. So I'm going two days ago, it was total pea soup from Carlsbad to uh, Artesia. So I'm driving through fog to drive somebody to, to one of those unnecessary appointments that endangers a veteran, that endangers a driver, and that endangers everybody else who is on the same road with them. So, you know, uh, I have talked to representatives of senators and congressmen about that and said, this is nonsense and you need to do something about it. Nobody ever does anything, so if I can encourage everybody in this room who has any kind of leverage with any of our political representatives to improve this system in line with what that lady said, what that gentleman said. But I want to clarify, it's not the VA. It's who contracted to provide the health service. It's the insurance company that got the contract. It's not the VA, and unfortunately, a lot of our veterans think it is the VA, but it's the contract that pays for these other doctors. It's not the VA hospital. Yes, so I think this really just um, amplifies the how rural it is. So in Redoso, there's only one uh, primary care doctor that contracts with the VA. Um, there's no mental, psychiatric, behavioral health doctors in Redosa that contract with the VA. The closest is Alan Gordo. So that's just, it is what it is. So there's, that's really um, amplifying the rural part of it. You know, there's only so many providers in each town. Most of them won't contract with the VA for whatever reason. So that's rural. You have to drive somewhere instead of having it done in your own community yeah. through community care. That's one last question. Uh, just a point in, in regards to medical staff here in New Mexico, in the VA, the number I heard, which was a few months ago, was that there are 6,000 vacancies in the medical field uh, in the VA system here in New Mexico. So you amplify that with what the gentleman was saying, uh, 
throughout the league. Um, it's something that's not going to be fixed until you do have adequate staff to provide the adequate and necessary services that are needed to take care of veterans. It doesn't matter what you do, uh, communication wise, uh, grant wise, or whatever. If the people, the staff, the support staff is not there available, then it's trash, basically. It is just collapsing in and upset. And there's no way you're going to support the 143,000 veterans in New Mexico if you have 6,000 vacancies. <laughs> uh, you know, you can go to any seed bar, and if you try and go in there on an emergency basis, what are they going to tell you? Go to the local hospital. And you used to be able to before COVID, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, you could call them up and say, I have this problem. I cannot get, I don't want to go to the hospital. I want to see my doctor. <coughs> they usually had times each week that they would see patients on an emergency uh, basis. And that's no longer. So, I mean, community care, I've had experience with community care. Sometimes it works. A lot of times it doesn't. And it's, it's, it's not just one little picture about being rural. It is a big picture nationally. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your comments. And it's, it struck a chord with me that perhaps, you know, we've had our transportation conference, but my goodness, it, should there be a health conference centered around all of the issues um, that have been brought up here. I, I think it's a serious um, issue. And maybe that's something, maybe not this group, maybe a spin-off of our group. Maybe that's something we can try to do together. Think, Donnie? That's it. All right, great. Well, I really want to thank all of you for coming and participating. I'm sorry I kept you past 12, but um, I don't think that'll interfere with your lunch. Um, I also want to thank our partners who helped um, put this conference together. And that was, of course, the DAV, uh, uh, David Alderete, um, David Kaysen from Shuttle Rio Doso, Marie Mora, who left uh, with Rail Runner. She was fabulous. And I know I'm missing, oh, Hugo, of course. <laughs> He's our, our wonderful partner at the v Veterans Transportation Services with the VA. And our staff as well. Um, gosh, I hope I didn't miss anyone. The VIC. Thank you, Tracy. We appreciate all your help on the planning committee. And uh, did I miss someone? Uh, yes, our secretary, Quintana. Yes. Do you have something, sir? No, I just want to just want to thank you all. Uh, moving forward, we will be putting together a council, uh, be it veteran council across the state. My anticipation is that we will have representation from transportation, housing, education, benefits, medical, blah blah blah. Right. But the other thing that we can do is we can put together a work group on the transportation thing. Nothing is worse than having dialogue without actionable items, right? So one of the things we definitely want to do is turn all of this conversation, all of these great ideas that you all thought of, and put it into actionable items so that we can accomplish something and move the dial forward. So I thank you all for coming with an open mind. I will be with you on one on one. And anybody else, I'll stay here as long as I need to to answer anybody's questions. Bottom line is, I really appreciate the fact that you have an open mind about what are the opportunities. We all know what the problems and the challenges are, right? We don't gain anything by focusing solely on problems. We gain by coming up with solutions. 
on how we mitigate those problems. So your ideas are tremendous. We have a lot of work to do. Let's go out there and do a lot of work. I wish you all a very happy Christmas, merry uh, happy holiday season. Please be safe out there. Look forward to our next engagement. This is just an initiation of a dialogue and a conversation. This is not the solve all cure all. Thank you all so much. We'll let you go. Thank you.